Hey, today we're going over the theory behind hotspot analysis. We're gonna to try to understand the GI and the GI star statistics. Our objective with hotspot analysis is to identify clusters of high or low values in space. We're gonna use a tool called LISA to do this. LISAs are local indicators of spatial association. LISAs decompose global statistics to a local level. The local Moran's eye is the most famous of these statistics. Luke Anslin wrote, as an operational definition, I suggest that a local indicator of spatial association LISA, is any statistic that satisfies the following two requirements. The LISA for each observation gives an indication of the extent of significant spatial clustering of similar values around that observation. The sum of LISAs for all observations is proportional to a global indicator of spatial association. More formally, but still in general terms, I express a LISA for a variable y sub i observed at location i as statistic L sub i such that L sub i equals f of y sub i, y j sub i. That's saying that a local indicator is a function of an observed value at a location and that location's neighboring values. So which LISA do we use for hotspot analysis? For hotspot analysis, we use the Geddes Ord GI and GI star statistic. There's a subtle difference between the two and we'll go over that later. The GI and the GI star are local versions of the Geddes Ord Global G statistic. The Geddes Ord G informs us of the presence of high, high, or low, low clustering. That is, high values clustered around other high values and low values clustered around other low values. And the Global G is defined as such. And don't worry, we're gonna do our best to break it down, but maybe not in as much detail as we did with the spatial lag. So let's start looking at the local Geddes Ord G or the GI statistic. Most global statistics are a double sum, first over J and then I. So here's the global G again. What we do is for each element I, we do some sort of operation over the neighbor's J. And then once we've done that for every single element from I to N, we sum that up. And same with the denominator. We can decompose this G into a local indicator of spatial association. So GI for each element is the sum of the spatial weights times the neighboring values divided by the denominator is the sum of all X values except XI. The numerator of the GI is the spatial lag, whereas the denominator is the sum of all X values excluding x sub i. We get gi as the ratio of the spatial lag divided by the sum of all x values except the one that's observed. And in the Geoda documentation, Luke Anslin writes, it's the ratio of a weighted average of the values in the neighboring locations to the sum of all values, not including the value at the location. So let's take this example. We have this grid, it's a seven by seven grid, and these are the values that it has. This grid does display some level of spatial autocorrelation. On the bottom left side, we can see that there are some high values in the center. There's a very, very low value close to zero. And to its right, there's another low value at around 0 0.25. And this is what the data looks like as an SF object in R. There are 49 rows. Each row is a square in that grid. Now, how do we calculate the numerator? Well, the numerator is just the spatial lag. If you haven't seen that video yet, go check it out. All right, here's the result of that mutate statement. On the far right side, we can see that we have this new x lag variable. And this is what the lag looks like visualized. Now the denominator, this is where it gets tricky. It's the sum of all x values, excluding the observed one. Or we can think of it as the spatial lag of a complete graph with binary weights. To create binary weights in SFDEP, we use the argument style equals b. Now a complete graph, on the other hand, is when our neighbor matrix is completely connected. We set the argument diag equals false. So we don't include the observed location in our neighbor's list because it's not a neighbor to itself. We can think about this a different way. So we create this complete graph where we set n is equal to the number of rows in our grid. And we say diag equals false because we don't want to include ourselves. So if we look at the first observation in our neighbor's list, we see that the first element is not one because we're not including that observation in our neighbors list. We calculate that spatial lag of the X variable on our new complete graph neighbors. And we're passing in binary style weights so that instead of getting a weighted average, we're just getting a total sum. Let's put this all together in a single dplyr mutate statement where we say complete NB, that new column is equal to ST complete NB. And we actually get to use the dplyr helper function N to say the number of rows in our data set. Since diag equals false, is the default, we don't have to set it ourselves. We're creating a binary weights list of our complete neighbors list. Lastly, we calculate the denominator by passing in X, 
the complete neighbors list and the new binary weights matrix to our st lag function. And this is our result where we have x, x lag, and the sum of xj or the denominator. The gi is just the ratio of that numerator and denominator. The gi is just x underscore lag divided by sum underscore xj. And we're gonna scale it to return a z score. So here we can see the resultant gi value. And you'll note that this has this comma one. That's because we didn't actually cast this as a numeric vector. By default, scale returns a matrix. What is the GI star? I mentioned that at the beginning. The only difference is in the neighbor matrix. The GI star includes the observation I in the calculation of GI, whereas GI does not. So often GI is just rewritten as this equation here, where J is not equal to I. I don't necessarily like this because they're the same, except the neighbor list. It's just the conception of who our neighbors are that changes what the GI versus GI star is. So when we calculate the GI star, the importance of the observed X value is displayed in the calculated GI star. The GI star includes the observed value or the focal observation in its neighbors list. To do that in SFDEP, we use the include self function, which takes a neighbors list as its input. So these are two plots of a neighbors matrix. And on the left-hand side, we can see that across the diagonal, there are empty values. Whereas on the right-hand side, those are filled in. And that's what's happening when we include the self in our neighbors list. That those values now take on the value of one as a neighbor if we're thinking about a binary weights matrix. So those are gonna be included in any calculation that we use using that neighbors list moving forward. We can recreate what we've done previously to calculate the GI star. One of the cool things here is that instead of having to do the complete graph, we instead can just sum the total value of X and then we can divide the lag by the denominator and scale it to get a GI. How do we actually interpret the values of the GI or the GI star? Well, a high GI value means that there's a location with a high value neighborhood whereas a low GI value has a location with a low value neighborhood. Hypothesis testing with local indicators of spatial association takes a different approach than what you might be used to. Due to the nature of spatial data, we're not able to have the same sort of assumptions that we do with typical hypothesis testing. So instead, we create an empirical distribution from which to compare our observed result. If you haven't read my blog post yet on conditional permutations, I suggest you give it a quick read. In short, we create a number of permutations where we randomly sample our geography and recalculate our statistics. And after a number of replications, so say 499 or 999, so on and so forth, we now have an empirical reference distribution that we can compare our observed value to. With this kind of hypothesis testing, we're really checking to see if an observed value is or is not spatially dependent. So our null hypothesis may be phrased one way is that the observed value is not spatially dependent, whereas the alternative is that the observed value is spatially dependent. Or we can think about this alternatively again as we would expect to find this value under complete spatial randomness. And that's what we're doing when we're creating those permutations. When we randomly sample our geographies, we're trying to simulate complete spatial randomness. And if we do find a value that deviates from that randomness a bunch of times, then we kind of reject our null hypothesis and we say, under complete spatial randomness, we would not expect to find this value. All right, with a lot of that theory out of the way, let's look at how we do this using SFDEP line by line. So the first thing we do is load SFDEP, then we're gonna load the tidyverse, and let's just use this GURI data set. Again, I just love it, it is a phenomenal data set. As always, with everything we're gonna do, we always create our neighbors list first. So we'll use ST contiguity on the geometry column. Then we'll calculate the weights. And now we can calculate the GI. GI equals local G perm. And let's look at crime PERS. Pass in our neighbors list and our weights and our number of simulations. Let's set it to 999. I'll store this in the object GURI GI. What happens with these local G perm function and most other functions in SFDEP is the GI column is actually a data frame itself. So what we need to do is pull this data frame out of a column and stick it on to the existing data frame. The way we do that is using unnest 
and then the name of the column. I can select the GI column and see it here. Or we can look at the P values, P folded sim, for example, here. Uh, let's look at glimpse. After we glimpse our data frame, we can see all of the different columns that we have associated with our GI, where we have our GI statistic, our expected GI, the variance, the P value, the simulated P value, the folded simulated P value, skewness, and kurtosis. Now that was just the GI. In order to do the GI star, let's copy this. Again, GI star includes the self. And we can see that in this message, we see that we're getting the GI star. At this point, you've now calculated the GI star or the GI statistic, and you can go through whatever steps you'd like to visualize those appropriately. I will post a link to the video where I did a walkthrough of visualizing hotspot analysis, and that might help you get going further. All right, great. Um, thank you for your time. If you have any suggestions on what you'd like to see next, please let me know in the comment section below. Thanks.